Rabbi Shadasa Benito. She's going to speak uh, on the protocols of the elders of Zion. The title of the talk is The Jewish Conspiracy, a Strategic Weapon to Demonize Jews and Delegitimize Israel. And if there's one subject and one topic and one book that you're going to read on contemporary anti-Semitism and to understand the history of anti-Semitism and how it relates today, this is the book and I think this is the lecture that you ought to hear. Um, and I'm not saying this lightly, I mean, I mean this, that if there is a, a hero in the, this struggle to under, uncover contemporary anti-Semitism and to fight for truth uh, in exposing it, it's uh, Judge Benito. So it's really a privilege that she, she's here. And I'm not using the words just to flatter. I'm being very s serious and sincere. Uh, Hadassah Benito is the Honorary President of the International Association for Jewish Lawyers and Jurists. She's a retired judge and served as a judge in Israel for 31 years. She serves today on many government committees and, and boards in Israel. And she speaks literally across the world. Her book has been translated into nine languages and is sold throughout the world. She received a degree at Northwestern University in Chicago, Illinois, and she also studied at Denver uh, University in Colorado. She was an acting justice of the Israeli Supreme Court. She was Israel's uh, on Israel's delegation to the United Nations General Assembly. She was a criminal lawyer, and she also taught at Bar Ilan University. In addition to this book, uh, The Lie That Wouldn't Die, uh, The Protocols of the Elders of Zion, She's written a book entitled Pink Pearls from Shanghai, and she's currently writing her third book. Um, she, her family and herself survived the Shoah. She served uh, in the Israeli Defense Forces during the War of Independence. She won the Zeltner Prize for Israel's Astounding Jurist. And in 2003, she received a citation of merit from Israel's uh, Bar Association for Women in Law. And although she told me not to say this, I will, she refused or turned down a seat on the Supreme Court of, of Israel to spend her time, her, her own money, her, own, her, her years of her work writing this book on her own because she thought that this was the, the issue that we really have to understand historically to understand the delegitimization of Israel today. And she really was a laborer on, on her own for many years and of great sacrifice to do this, and I, I think it's a privilege that we're here to listen to the all these years of work and sacrifice. So, by this, I always make a lot of notes and I end up not looking at them <laughs> because there's not enough time. Okay, thank you Charles, it's a privilege to be here and uh, to participate in the wonderful work that you are doing here and I'm particularly privileged to work together with Charles because we belong to the same club. Uh, the club, uh, this club is a club of a very small number of people, actually almost a handful of people who understand the danger and the importance of this document, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. Most people don't, although everybody who speaks on anti-Semitism mentions the word, the code word, Protocols of the Elders of Zion, but there are very few people who realize what it really is and how dangerous it is. So the Protocols of the Elders of Zion today, or the so-called Jewish conspiracy, if you will, is today a major item on the global political agenda. And it's a major item on the political agenda not only to do with Jews and not only to do with the Middle East, but it has to do with world peace. But it's, it's easy to say that. How do you prove it? Volume? Yeah. Can you hear me now? Okay. It's difficult to prove if you just speak of today, but the fact that I wrote a book that's almost 400 pages is because I felt, after I learned about the story, I felt 
that if you don't know the historical context, if you don't follow the story of the protocols from the beginning till today, and you don't know what happened with them and to them, and to who was involved, and to use them and for what purposes, then you really cannot fathom, cannot understand the danger of this book today. So I suggest that I'll take you on a little journey with me. I call it the journey to the land of the protocols. It's a historical journey, but it's a very interesting journey. We go back more than 100 years. I want to present a picture. The Tsar was still sitting on his throne in Russia. The Romanov dynasty was still ruling in Russia. There were five million Jews in the Russian Empire, in the big Russian Empire, five million Jews. And they were discriminated against. They were not allowed to live everywhere. There was numerous clauses at universities, and so on and so forth. You probably know that story. And the black hundreds were roaming the streets saying, beat the Jews and save Russia and the Ohrana and everything that you probably know. So I'm not going into it. But the Bolsheviks were preparing a revolution. And they had little cells of Bolsheviks which were in danger, in great danger in Russia. So they decided to work outside Russia. And they started little cells of Bolsheviks in various countries in Europe. Their center was in Paris. And the secret police, the Ochrana, sent a special representative to, to Paris to be in charge of finding out, of finding all these little cells and cooperating with, lo with local authorities to do away with them, I mean, to save Russia from the outside. This man, who is a major hero in my book, is called Pyotr Rachkovsky. Now that the archives in Russia opened, while I was writing my book, we have original documents of Mr. Rachkovsky and his correspondence with his bosses in Russia and what he was preparing and what he was doing. Now, it's important to understand this. We are speaking of the end of the 19th century, the 90s of the 19th century. You will remember that this was the time of the Dreyfus Affair. The whole world was aware of what's happening around the Dreyfus Affair in France. Terrible anti-Semitism in Russia, terrible anti-Semitism in France. The difference between the two is this. Anti-Semitism in France was intellectual anti-Semitism. Even when they stripped Dreyfus in a, public, um, in, a, in a public square, stripped him of his rank and broke his sword and cried in the streets, death to the Jews, not one Jew was killed. Jews were not killed, they were just shouting. In Russia, you know, Russian anti-Semitism was violent, pogrom anti-Semitism. So when these two came together, this was a little combination, a little cooperation between Russian and French anti-Semitism. And why did they cooperate? Because the Russians in France talked to the local police and they didn't want, the local police did not want these little Russian cells preparing bombs in small hotels in Paris, so they helped the Russians. And they, this is how they cooperated. Now, by big coincidence, and I won't go into all the little stories, although they are very interesting, the wife of the commandant of the police in Paris was a lady called Juliette Adam. At that time, women couldn't function in the public arena. They, they couldn't hold office, but they were intelligent women who wanted to, to make their mark. They went to universities, they wrote books, they even owned newspapers like Juliette Adam. So what they did is, all over Europe, they had the famous salons. You probably read that in that literature. In, in Russia, in, in Germany, in France, they had salons. There were literary salons and there were political salons. Juliette Adam had a political salon. And it was in her salon, mostly, that they prepared the Dreyfus trial. We know that now. And it was very difficult to get on the list of invitees to that Salon. Only important people came there. And her husband, the commandant of the French police, brought Mr. Rachkovsky to Juliette Adam's salon. And this is where the collaboration started between, I 
make it in very broad you know, lines between this Russian representative and the French. And we know now that the idea of the protocols of the elders of Zion began in the salon of Madame Joliette. Madame uh, 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 Joliette. Anyway, actually, many of you might think that the protocols were composed in Russian in Russia. Most people think that. So I have a surprise for you. They were written in France and French. Why in French? Because most of the protocols, like two-thirds of the protocols, are a plagiarism from a French book. Tra copied verbatim from a French book that had nothing to do with Jews or with, or with protocols of Jews. It's a book called Dialogue aux Enfers, Dialogues in Hell, between two people, and it was written by a French lawyer by the name of Maurice Jolie. It's important to say that because this is the beginning of the whole story. We have to go back to the beginnings. Monsieur Maurice Jolie was a lawyer in France, and he was very upset by the regime of Napoleon III, and he decided to write a book and to explain to the French people why they should uprise, why they shouldn't take what Napoleon III is handing out to them. But it was very dangerous to do that in France in those days. He would be arrested immediately. So he decided to use a literary form that was very popular in those days, to write it in the form of an allegory. You know what an allegory is? And he chose to make a kind of a dialogue between two people, but he had to choose two outstanding figures so that the French would understood, won't understand what he means. So he describes in his autobiography how he was walking by the Seine, breaking his head, and suddenly the idea came to him that the regime of Napoleon III would be represented by no other than Mr. Machiavelli, of course. And the ideas of the liberal author would be represented by the liberal Mr. Montesquieu. So this is a dialogue between Machiavelli and Montesquieu. Machiavelli explains to Montesquieu how it is important that one person is in charge of the whole world, how the dumb people, how you can cheat the dumb people and tell them that you're doing it for their good. And he explains in 24 chapters, he explains exactly how this one ruler can take over the world and rule the world, how to do, do away with the police force, how to do away with the legal system, how to, do, how to create havoc in the, in the in working place. And so, uh, and so on and so forth. Do away with lawyers, of course, how to kill some key politicians, and so on and so forth. 24 chapters. In the end, a pearl, this book. Wonderful French, very well written. Very few of it exist till now. I'll tell you why. I have one. Very few exist because when the book came out, it didn't come out in France. It was too dangerous. It came out in Brussels. But when the author, Maurice Jolie, came back to France, he was immediately arrested by the French police because he hoped that, um, that the popula population will understand, but of course the authorities also understood what he meant. So he was immediately arrested, he was put on trial, he was sent to prison, he was fined. I have all these uh, court proceedings all the way up to the Supreme Court, he served 18 months in prison. Very interesting man, Mr. Jolie, I have a whole chapter about him, in the end he committed suicide. Not because of this, but he committed suicide in the end. But his book was banned. His book was banned, it wasn't it only a few copies were privately held, and most important, one copy of Jolie's book rested in the National Library in Paris. It's still, it's still there. This was the book from which the protocols were copied. They had the idea, and we have Rachkovsky's letters to Russia, to his bosses in the Ochrana, describing how he, they, they used forgeries a lot in those days, Describing how he's put a special man by the name of Kolovinsky. He's sitting in the National Library, he's using a French book, and they are preparing a document that would once and for all convince the Tsar and the present rulers of the Romanov dynasty that the Jews are to blame for everything. This is how this Jewish conspiracy began. This was the beginning. So I can't go with you into um, details, but I'll tell you this. This document, which was not, although written in French, was not published in France, 
because they knew that the French public are not going to take it. So it went to Russia. It was translated into Russian. And for a few years, it could not be published because the Tsar vetoed it. The Tsar hated Jews, but he wrote a small note. He said that the, the idea was very good to do away with the Jews, but you can't reach a good aim, he said, by wrong means. And to use it, he was told it's a forgery by his experts, and he wouldn't allow it. So then comes a story which is fit for a soap opera. Really, it's a story of a fanatic by the name of Sergei Nilus who had one wife and one lover, and he, his wife had been a lady in waiting. And, and anyway, this, and his, the sister-in-law of the Tsar, who was a great anti-Semite, helped get the censorship committee to allow Mr. Nilus to publish the protocols. In the meantime, parts of the protocols were published in the Znamia newspaper and served for the big pogroms in Russia. They were handing out leaflets with parts of the protocols to show why Jews have to be killed in the big pogroms 1903, 1905, because this is what they are. They are going to, to take over the world. Important that until the end of World War I, until the end of the revolution, the protocols were published again and again only in Russia. They never left Russia. They never went anywhere else. It was only it, after the revolution where officers of the White Army, of the Russian White Army, spread around the world. They took with them copies of the protocols of the elders of Zion, and they took with them a message. And the message was, look what the Jews did in Russia. They toppled the Romano dynasty, the throne of the Tsar, whom the Russians called Papka and Mamka. And, the, and this is what's going to happen to you. You have Jews in your countries. They are going to do away with your rulers, your kings, your prime ministers, whatever. It's going to happen to you. And in those days, Europe, after the Russian Revolution, which made a big impact, the rest of the world, not only Europe, this country too, was gripped in what they called a Red Scare. They were really afraid that what happened in Russia is going to happen to them. And this was the proof. The protocols were the proof. And between 1919 and 1921, for these two years, the protocols made their way across the world and were published in every language, in every country around the world. And I'm not exaggerating, in every country. And edition after edition, the Germans even dared say that the Jews were to blame for, for the war which they started. That was the Times of London published in 1920 an article when the protocols were published in London under the name The Jewish Peril. Times of London published an article that this has to be investigated. It's a serious matter. And it ended with the words, have we escaped Pax Germanica to fall into Pax Judaica? It was one year later that the correspondent of the Times of London was one of the three people, 1921, who discovered the truth about the protocols, how they were copied from a French book, and so on and so forth. But that's a different story, and I call this in my book 19, 1921, the year of the protocols, because this was the year where truth was discovered by three different people in three different countries. So it started going around. It started going around the world and making its impact. It could never be stopped. It could never be stopped. But I would like to talk for a minute about this country, because in the 1920s, the protocols were a big thing in the United States of America because of Henry Ford. Henry Ford, who was an outstanding anti-Semite, his picture was on the desk of Hitler, autographed Heinrich Ford. He published in his newspaper, Dearborn Independent. He published over 90, I think 92 or 97, over 90 installments, daily installments, with texts blaming the Jews, all based on the protocols and on local happenings in, in America. So it was a big thing in America. Later, I will talk a little 
about what was done about the protocols because it began with Henry Ford. Jews dared in those days take on publishers of the protocols and take them to court. And actually, the two Jews in this country were the first ones who had the idea to take the publisher to court. And they dared, two Jews by the name of Bernstein and Sapiro, dared take Henry Ford to court. And they sued him in a court in Detroit. It's a, this went on for years because the, it was all lawyers' work, because he had the big lawyers. It's a dramatic trial that took place and ended in 1927. It ended with a settlement. It ended with a settlement like all trials that took place before Hitler came to power. Because until 1933, there were trials against the distributors of the protocols. And in a trial, when you take the people to court, they have to bring evidence. They have to show where they got that this is a true document. And of course, you can say anything you like in the media, but when you come to court and you have to give testimony, you have to bring proof. And of course, they had no proof that the protocols were authentic because they were a forgery. So, in the end, all the trials that took place, and I don't have time now to enumerate all of them, I wrote about them, all the trials, Germany, Switzerland, America, all the trials, there was even a trial in Japan, all the trials ended in settlement. In the end, the defendants said, mea culpa, we're sorry, we got it from wrong sources, we, we apologize to the Jews, Henry Ford even apologized publicly to the Jews, he ordered truckloads of protocols to be, um, to be burned. Uh, it was too late because his book had already been published in 17 languages and Hitler didn't mind his retraction. But anyway, this is what happened with the settlements. Now, now began a parallel, parallel um, uh, phenomenon. On one hand, the communist regime that came after the Tsar started using the protocols for their own purposes, blaming the Jews. The blaming the Jews suddenly became very, very in. This is on one hand. On the other hand, Hitler used, as soon as the protocols were published in Germany, Hitler got onto them, and when Hitler was sitting in prison and writing Mein Kampf, he used the protocols in Mein Kampf. I will never forget how Jean Kirkpatrick, who was the United States ambassador to the United Nations, told me one day, we talked about another matter, and we talked about the Zionism racism equation, and she said, I can't believe, that's what she told me, she said, I can't believe that the same thing is happening to the same people twice in one generation. You did not read Mein Kampf. Had you read Mein Kampf, you would have known what was coming. And now the writing is again on the wall and Jews don't look. I'm quoting verbatim what she said to me about the equation, but it's true about the protocols too. Hitler used the protocols. Now, I come to a chapter, and I go very quickly because I want to reach to other matters. I come very quickly to Hitler. But before I come to Hitler, I told you that Jews were murdered in pogroms by a crowd that was incited by the protocols of the elders of Zion. But many people died outside of Russia because of the protocols. But the first, the very first victim outside of Russia was a German Jew. Who was it? It was the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Walter Rathenau. Walter Rathenau was a very famous Jew in Germany. He had served the German government very well during the First World War. He was a hero in Germany. Later, when he died, when he was murdered, they say that one million people showed up for his funeral. But in 1922, Walter Rathenau was murdered on the way to work. And nobody knew why. They caught two murderers. One of them committed suicide in, in, the, in prison. The other one, by a student by the name of Tekov, was put on trial. And his defense was, 
his defense was, before a German judge in Leipzig, his defense was, Rathenau was not murdered, he was executioned as an elder of Zion. He was a, one of the elders of Zion and we executed him because it's a danger to Germany. So Walter Rathenau, this famous Jew who was Minister of Foreign Affairs in Germany, he was a German hero, was the first victim killed because of the protocol, officially killed. And I don't have time to quote to you, but I have in my book what the German judge had to say about it. He said, later I will tell you how different judges, different historians, different persons throughout the century warned us of the danger. The first one who really warned us about this document was the judge who um, conducted the trial against Mr. Tekov for the murder of Walter Rathenau. When Hitler came to power in 1933, he decided, together with Goebbels, they decided, and most people don't know that, they decided that the protocols of the Elder of Zion would be a major item in Nazi propaganda. For years, I didn't know why. I mean, I didn't know how they arrived at it. But I want to quote one small quotation just to show you. One of the two introductions to my book, one introduction was by the Lord Chief Justice of England, and the other introduction was by an American judge, Judge Edward Corman, the United, Chief Judge of the United States District Court for the Eastern District of New York. He was he's a very famous American judge because he, to this day, for many years now, is conducting the class action against the Swiss banks on the dormant accounts, Judge Corbett. So Judge Corbett wrote the foreword to my book. And among other things, he, he looked it up for himself. He doesn't quote from my book. And he, among other things, he describes, he quotes a passage from the diaries of Mr. Goebbels. And this is what he said. He said, I was particularly startled to read in the diaries of Goebbels under 18 May 1943, an entry. And he says this, Goebbels says, I have devoted exhaustive study to the protocols of the elders of Zion, speaks Goebbels. In the past, the objection was always that they aren't suited to present, to present day propaganda. In reading them now, I find that we can use them very well. The protocols of the elders of Zion are as modern today as they were when they were published for the first time. Leaders today of Muslim countries say the same. We have the same. They are as modern today as they were when they were fabricated. But this doesn't end. The entry by Goebbels continues as follows, and I quote, at noon, Goebbels says, I mentioned this to the Führer. He believed the protocols were absolutely genuine. After a long recital of the Führer's fulminations against Jews and the references to the Jewish peril, Goebbels quotes the Führer, and here Hitler speaks. There is therefore no other recourse left for modern nations except to exterminate the Jew. The nations that have been the first to see through the Jew and have been the first to fight him are going to take his place in the domination of the world. Here you have the whole story. Here you have the whole story of why, why he exterminated the Jews. He believed that they were going to dominate the world and he said it's us, it's, it's a, the fight between the Germans and the Jews. We want to do it. Now, to prove this, I have a little story. After my book was published, I had a visit from a German historian by the name of Wolfram Meyer zu Uptrup. A historian, a German historian, a young person, he came to my house and he said, what a pity that you didn't meet me before you published your book, because I could have given you more material. Because he wrote a doctoral thesis on the subject, this is his subject, how Hitler used the protocols of the elders of Zion on the way to the final solution. So I told him, how, what does that have to do with the final solution? 
And he has a theory, and he presented his theory to me in his thesis, and now his doctoral thesis is in the form of a book, unfortunately only in German, not yet published. He says that in order, and this is very relevant to what we have today, he says that Goebbels was right in one thing. You cannot do anything, you cannot implement any plan, unless you sell it to the multitudes, to the, to the public. You have to recruit large number of people to do your dirty work. And you have to incite them. And in order to incite them, you have to give them a reason. You have to give them a reason why to murder Jews. Otherwise, it's not going to work. Like I asked you today, why would hundreds of millions of Muslims go out in the streets in faraway countries and burn Israeli flags and in the name of Hamas, whom they not, about whom they don't care, they've never seen a Palestinian in their life. I mean, it's the same thing. You have to, this is one lesson we didn't learn. We didn't learn that you have, it's words. It begins with words. So what Mr. Zuruptrup told me, he said that the, the initial idea of the Nazis against the Jews was that the Jews were untermenschen. They were dirt. They were, they were dirty in the world. I mean, they were garbage. You had to do away with them. But he had a problem. The German intelligentsia knew their Jews. They had Jewish neighbors, they had Jewish partners, they had law firms. They knew the Jews were, were authors and they were musicians and they were Nobel Prize winners. How can you say that they were garbage? So for the better public in Germany, he had to have another theory. This theory was based on the protocols. That is why they made the protocols a centerpiece in their propaganda. Because the Jews want to dominate the world. And we want to dominate the world. We want to establish for a, hundred, a thousand year Reich, as you know. And as long as the Jews are there, they'll do it. So we have to do away with them, so we can do it. Isn't it a strange thing that three big movements in our time have on their agenda, officially, domination of the world? The communists, they say they want, you know why, with their, with their polit political theories. The Nazis want to take over the world. And now the Muslim extremists, the Muslim fundamentalists, they do it through religion. I mean, these three movements don't make a secret of it. They say we want to take over the world through religion, through politics, whatever. And isn't it strange that all these three movements use the protocols of the elders of Zion to say that it's the Jews who want to dominate the world? That's the strange thing. So he says Hitler needed the protocols. He needed the protocols in order to convince the Germans that we'll never have a thousand year Reich, and of course they were very nationalistic, if we don't do away with the Jews. And in the trials where Nazis testified, I'll, in a minute, whenever I have time, I'll tell you, they, they, they said that this is, this is a, really why Hitler needed to exterminate the Jews, not only in Germany, but everywhere, all the Jews. Why? Because as long as there are any Jews left anywhere, there is a danger that they are so devious that they will do it. And how do we know that the Jews are going to do it? This is their document. We have proof. And this document, the protocols, is different from any other document against the Jews. Why? Because, do I have a glass or some, for some water? No. Okay, I'll drink from the bottle. I need some water. Why? Because other documents, like blood libels, for instance, or Jews uh, contaminated uh, the wells, or whatever, other documents say, uh, consist of something that others say about the Jews. This one document, this is the only document, in which the Jews speak. It is what they, you don't believe us? Read this, this is what the Jews say about themselves. Because the protocols purport to be real minutes of, of meetings of a secret Jewish international government. And these minutes tell you exactly what their plan is. Now, the thing that most people don't know is 
that the text of the protocols never varies. It is the same text throughout the years, for over 100 years. But every issue of the protocols contains a large, a long introduction, very important introduction. And these introductions change from one edition to another. And they serve two purposes. One purpose. <coughs> you say that these are minutes of meetings of a secret Jewish government. So how did you obtain it? How do we get it? So they had to concoct a story of how it fell into their hands. And strangely enough, there were different stories. One story was that the lover of Herzl, and one story was that, uh, I mean, different stories. I won't go into them. But the most important and the most popular story was, because the time was ri ripe, because in 1897, more or less the time of the protocols when they were concocted, there was the first Zionist Congress in Basel, Switzerland. So the most popular story was that this Zionist Congress was just a sham, it was just a show for the world. Actually, that, that's what they showed the press. But behind the scenes, the Jewish leaders were convening and preparing domination of the world, and that's where the protocols came from. And this silly story became so credible that later when there were trials, big trials, against the publishers of the protocols in Bern, Switzerland, and in Grahamstone, South Africa, for instance, they actually had to prove to the court that during the Zionist Congress, nothing like that took place. In order to prove that, they brought to Bern to the trial Chaim Weizmann, who was later the president of Israel, and he had to swear and, and testify that nothing like that took place. And in South Africa, the same year there was a trial, Chaim Weizmann was not available, so they brought his follower, Nachum Sokolov, you know, he was later also president of the Zionist organization, and he came to testify to the same. They're believed so, and this story is still going around in, in Arabic editions. So that is one thing. How did we receive the protocols? But there's another, much more important reason for these introductions. How would people believe that there is actually such a Jewish plan? Jews are such a small minority in the world. They, are, they had the Holocaust, you know. And I mean, even before the Holocaust, how would they believe? There's proof. What is the proof? Because this plan, this Jewish plan, is being implemented right now in our country at this time. And then, wherever, whatever happens in the world, you can say it's the Jews. Because Mauricio Lee wrote such a wonderful book that you can pinpoint and say there is a recession, 1929 and now again, for open chapter five of the protocols and they plan the recession. And if there is AIDS, or chicken flu, or now pig flu, they were going to spread illness. And it's in the protocols. They were spreading epidemics. It's in the protocol, chapter 8. And there's an underground bomb. They planned it too. It's chapter 9. I mean, it's being implemented. It's happening. It's happening right here in your country. And this is how an international plot becomes so relevant to people in each country. It's happening to you, it's happening now, Jews are taking over. And that is why, when you look throughout the 20th century, it's not the same book that is published every, every year, or every two years, or whatever, now in, in Arabic every year, actually, you have to publish a new edition. Why? The protocols are the same, but you have to have a new introduction, because things happen. Before 9-11, it's a different story than after 9-11. <coughs> after 9-11, you have to have a new introduction, because you have to blame the Jews for 9-11, which they do. And for, if there's an epidemic of AIDS, you have to have a new introduction. And it's, it's going and going. So this idea of the Nazis, of Hitler, of Goebbels actually, that you need to convince people that the Jews are a real danger to the world, it's not enough to say so. 
It, people have to feel it on their skin. They have to feel it in their pockets. They have to feel it in their everyday life. If the, the, the um, some the money crash, you know, in, in Malaysia, the president of Malaysia can say, it's the Jews, it's the protocols. There are no, there are no Jews in Malaysia. So what? This is an international plot, and the Jews in Washington pull the strings. And it's all in the protocols, it's all there. So uh, that's why the protocols are in every country, and that's why you need every year a new edition. Now, we were, we were warned many times, I'll get to the trials in a minute, but we were warned, we, I say we, we Jews, we were warned many times throughout the century, throughout the century, the 20th century, what is going to happen, not only by what J.K. Patrick told me. And I want to give you a small list, and I, I chose a list only of non-Jews who warned us, non-Jews who warned us what's going to happen. So, in France there was a secret agent, secret agent of the French secret police, a very important man by the name of Henri, uh, Henri Roland. And um, he was an expert on Russia, actually. And later, when he retired from his job as a secret agent, he became a writer. He wrote historical, very important books. And he realized, when Hitler came to power, he realized that everything, that's what he said, that everything that was happening in European politics, all around Europe, has something, has something to do with the protocols of the elders of Zion. I mean, no Jew came up with it, but the secret French agent, he had a lot of information that others did not have. So he decided to write a book. He sat down and he wrote a huge book, 800 pages, a huge book, which is called L'Apocalypse de Notre Temps, the Apocalypse of Our Time, in French. Unfortunately, I have the book, but it's not translated into any other language. Now what happened was that he went through the whole story of European politics from country to country and he showed what I told you in the beginning about the protocols but he went much further and he showed exactly how there are footprints of this document in everything that's happening somehow in European politics. Unfortunately, it took him eight years to write the book and it was published in France on September 2nd, 1939, second day of the war. So of course nobody had, you know, nobody was free to read it. They had other things on their heads. But what's important, when the Nazis took France, they knew about this book. They immediately put this book, there were three lists of banned books in France by the Nazis. His book appears on every one of these three lists. It was completely banned. They went around to warehouses and stores, they burned the book, took it out. It vanished from the literary scene, you know, until when? Until 1991, when a small edition in France called Aliyah pub republished the book of Henri Roland. And somebody immediately let me know, and I went around to stores, and I, I, I have the book. It's a fantastic book. Henri Roland warned of, that this is going to happen. Now, I'll come to the trials in a minute because they were wonderful trials, but I want to say something about here. Imagine, in the middle of the Second World War, the extermination of Jews had already begun. But here, in this country, they were publishing the protocols of the elders of Zion and saying that Jews are to blame for the war. Here, America is sending soldiers and Jews are to blame for the war. And their proof, the protocols of the elders of Zion. Now, how do we know? Because a history professor of history and political science at the University of Columbia, by the name of John Curtis, decided to research the matter. It was so serious, he decided to research it. So he researched the matter, and he published his report in the form of a book, in the foreword, he described the antecedents of his family to show that he never, ever had any contact with Jews. He comes from a very good Christian family. But in order for this research to be well accepted, he had 
15 professor, professors from 15 important universities here in the United States signed this document telling the truth about the protocols. Nobody heard about it. I gave a lecture in Colombia and I said, do you know about John Curtis? No idea. I said, go to your archive. You know it's on the internet. You can get it on the internet. Go to John Curtis on the internet. And they didn't know about it in this country. I go, because I want to stay with America, I'll go later to other places. I want to I'm going directly to 1964. So in 1964, Israel, it's after the Holocaust. Israel already exists. And there's again the aftermath of the Red Scare of McCarthy times. You know what happened in this country, I don't have to tell you. And communists in this country who were being pers per persecuted spread, start republishing the protocols and spread the rumor that this country should not be afraid of international communism, you should be afraid of international Jewry. J-E-W-R-Y, international Jewry. That's what you should be scared of. And this was taken so seriously that the Senate of the United States, the Senate of the United States, the Judiciary Committee, or ju ju Committee for the Judiciary, I think you say, appointed a special subcommittee, nine important senators, to study the truth of this rumor, actually to study the protocols of the elders of Zion. And this subcommittee of nine important senior senators worked for months studying in 1964 the protocols of the elders of Zion. And lo and behold, they published a fantastic report I don't think there's any other report that used such strong language. I could quote, but I don't have time. It's all in my book. Nobody knew about it. Where did I find it, you will ask? I found it in the Library of Congress. It's right there. I have the whole, pro the whole report. Part of it I quoted in my book. When the ambassador of the United States to Israel gave a lecture about anti-Semitism, Mr. Kurtzer, I went up to him and I said, Mr. Kerzer, Mr. Ambassador, do you know this report of the nine senators of your Senate? Never heard of it. So he said, please do me a favor, send me the reference. Next day I sent him the reference by email. Now he has it. Okay, so I'm telling you, people warned us. And now the biggest warning came not only from, I could, I could go on quoting without end, but the biggest warning came from courts of law. As I told you, Jewish communities decided to take, like two Jews, Mr. Sapiro and Mr. Burns and Mr. Bernstein, took Henry Ford to court. Jews took the Nazis to court. Now, a very important note is this. The headquarters of the Nazis in the Brown House in Munich that issued the the directive to use the protocols as a major item, and we have that in writing, as a major item in Nazi propaganda, they also had another directive. The other directive was, if the Jews now dare to sue us on the matter of the protocols, we never settle again. We don't settle in all these trials, and we don't care if the out what the outcome is, we don't care what the court says. What we want is, we, and this is another thing that the Nazis refined, and we have to learn from them. They decided that in order to get the public opinion, they can use courtrooms as a forum to spread their message. This is a very important thing that they did. They decided to use courtrooms to spread their message through so-called expert witnesses. Now, this serves two purposes. One purpose is that these trials are covered by the press. So you have the press, I'll tell you in a minute about the Bern trial, press of the whole world was there. And so it's covered, it gets into the press, and we have a forum, we can speak out. But there's another thing in their devious minds. 
they started establishing chapters of Nazis in various countries. They sprang up, you know, like mushrooms after a rain. 33, 34, you had chapters, different names. They called themselves the Front in Switzerland, the Grey Shirt in South Africa, and so on and so forth. Now, they wanted to get out their message against the Jews to these countries. But they did not, they were afraid of the laws that they can be, if they spread things against the Jews in democratic countries, for instance, they can be sued. So what is the device? You use the court rule as a forum, and then you have a court record, official court record, with everything that their experts said. And then you send out booklets purporting to be part of a court record, which is protected, it's protected speech, and this is the way you can say anything you like against the Jews, hidden within the record of a court. Isn't that tedious? So it's, it's, it's really mind-boggling. And we know now, now we had a bit of luck. How do we know it? We don't have to guess. We know exactly what they planned and what they taught and what is now happening. In Bern, a small Jewish community, very small Jewish community in Bern, in 1933, realized what's happening across the border in Nazi Germany. And they realized that they also are in danger. And in 1933, the end of 1933, there was a big rally in Bern, Switzerland, of the new found front that distributed the protocols of the Elders of Zion. And they decided to take the Nazis to court. And the center of my book is the Bern trial, which is important for two, most important for two reasons. One reason is that we would not know a lot of things about the protocols, about the history of the protocols, were it not for the Berne trial. Because Russians, important Russians, who escaped the, the revolution to the West, were witnessed the forgery. And they came to testify in, the, in Switzerland, in the Berne court. There were important historians, there were politicians, there was members of the cabinet of the Tsar, head of the opposition. Okay, okay, I understand I don't have much, I'll overlap a little bit, but. <laughs> so the second important thing was that because the Swiss did not like the idea, the Swiss did not like the idea that they are getting directives from, from, from a foreign power, they, after the trial in Bern, they initiated criminal proceedings against the Nazis who were defendants in the trial. And they took search warrants and they searched the home of somebody made, named Freienwald. And this is how they got the whole archive of the Nazis. They told them exactly what their strategy was and how they conducted their defense in the trial. And that is why we know the strategy. Now, because I have so little time, I want to say this. I want, the rest is in my book if you want to read it, but I want to say this. Uh, I was asked to speak about cont contemporary times. But I must tell you one thing. You can't understand what is happening now in, in Muslim countries if you don't know the whole history. Because this is a continuation. This torch was passed from the Nazis at the end of the war to Muslim leaders. And they started distributing the protocols one country after another. And so the protocols became, the protocols are first and foremost a political document. And they became the major document in the, in, in, in the, the anti-Zionist campaign. Because first it was, a, it, was, it was first a European document, but now it became a major document in Muslim countries. It's a bestseller in book fairs, in Arabic book fairs. And every year it's published in, in, in Arabic language, enough in one country. And then it is spread to all <coughs> other countries that speak Arabic, and also, which is very important, to Muslim minorities in the West. We have voted in Edgeware Road in London, we have voted in France, we have, somebody voted for me in downtown Denver, Colorado. I mean, it's, it's, it's there, it exists. And it exists in the media, it exists in the Arabic media, including, unfortunately, the countries that made peace with Israel, both Jordan less, but mostly Egypt. And the Hamas 
has it in their charter as a reason to exterminate Jews, as a reason to exterminate Jews, it says so in their counter, mentioned the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. And now, because books are not enough, and internet would now spread the story around the world, this is also not enough. Because in these countries, there are unfortunately a lot of illiterate people. So it's not enough to have the books out there, it's not enough to spread the books, you have to get to these people and to recruit all these multitudes of people against this Israel, against Israel. So what do you do? You start making television series. And these television series, which are made like soap operas. The first series was made in Egypt, the horse without a horse. And when do they, it's completely, you know, it's riveting. It's, there is a princess there who brought out the protocols. It's all based on the protocols. And they sit and they explain exactly what, what the Jews are doing to the world. And 41 installments. And when do they do it? On the eve of Ramadan. You know, Muslims fast on Ramadan. And in the evening, they sit down with their families for the daily feast. Now, in modern Muslim families, they don't speak about religion. They watch television. The children watch television during these meals. So every night, they watch an installment of the soap opera based on the protocols of the elders of Zion. So one year, it was done in Egypt with government money, mind you, 200 actors, 200 actors, a lot of money invested. Next year, it was al Manar by the Hezbollah. Another year, it was Qatar. So every year, somebody else makes, and then they re, 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 cre, cre, screen it again and again and again. So it reaches not only people who have access to books, not only people who have access to internet, and of course Amazon sells the protocols, because why? Because it's in the form of a book. If it's in the form of a book, it may be, that's another story. How does free speech protect lies and libels? But even those who don't have access to books, who don't have access to the internet, now they can sit in sit with their children during Ramadan and watch these soap operas. And if you watch children's programs on television, children's programs in Arabic countries, including, including the Palestinian Authority, including Hamas, all these places, children's programs, of course the mosques are galore, it's all, the protocols appear everywhere. They appear not always as protocols of the elders of Zion, because this became a code word it's enough if you say protocols, it's enough if you say elders of Zion, it's enough if you say Jewish conspiracy. There's some code word always. And then it becomes a threat to world peace. And we are a threat to world peace. Now, if we don't understand that, if we don't understand that it is a weapon, it is a lethal weapon, it is a strategic weapon, if we don't look at what happened in the past, how it was used for a hundred years, and how it is now copied by a new movement, and how it is used for relevant, timely reasons right now, then we don't know what, dangerous, what danger we are facing. Just a little story to end. When Shimon Peres wrote a book after Oslo, he wrote two little stories. I'll end. First of all, he wrote, he wrote a book, The New Middle East. After Oslo, he believed that there's going to be a new Middle East. OK, I'm not going to speak about Oslo. But his book, The New Middle East, was published in many languages, also in Egypt. Now, in Egypt, they don't buy rights. These are pirate uh, publications. So there was a pirate publication of the book of Shimon Peres. And Shimon Peres couldn't read it, of course. It's Arabic, so nobody looked at it. They, you know, they published his book. One day, I get an email from no other than Bernard Lewis. You know who Bernard Lewis is, how important he is. About, and he says, do you know what happened with the book of Shimon Peres? I said, what? He says they wrote an introduction. In, in the introduction to Shimon Peres' book in Egypt, it says, the Jews maintain for many years, they say 200 years, which is not true, it's only 100 years. Okay, we won't go to court with them about that. They, the Jews say that this is a forgery, that there is no Jewish conspiracy to dominate the world. Read this book by Shimon Peres, and you will realize that it's all true. First, they are going to take over the Middle East, and then they'll take over the rest of the world. It's all in the introduction. So I, I showed it to Shimon Peres. He didn't know. 
Yeah. And the second story, which is really scary, is, you know, the Library of Alexandria. You know, this is the famous Library of Alexandria, which was closed for many years, and then it was renovated by no other than UNESCO. UNESCO paid for the whole renovation of the Library of Alexandria. It was a big cultural event because the Library of Alexandria is one of the wonders of the world. So, again, I hear from Bernard Lewis, because he follows these things. In this new Library of Alexandria, they had set aside a cabinet, a glass cabinet, dedicated to the three monotheistic religions. Very nice of them, okay? So, the Quran represents Islam, and the New Testament represents the Christian religion, and what represents the Jews in this cabinet, the protocols of the embers of Zion? True, it's an effect. So, there was a big outcry. You knew about it? There was a big outcry, and they wouldn't mind, except that the outcry was to UNESCO. They said to UNESCO, take away the funds, as long as they don't change this. So they had to do something about it. So they removed the protocols and put in a small Torah. And the editor had to go to Canossa, as it were, and he went, uh, he wrote in a newspaper an article or a television, and he said that it was done by mistake. They had the protocols as part of their library, historical library, it's a historical document, and now they, so there was a big outcry of extremists in Egypt against this head of the institute. They said, you succumbed to the Jews. You went down on your knees to the Jews. You took out the protocols. Imagine where this, how this, where this reaches. Later, Bernard Lewis was invited to speak at the, because he's such an eminent person around the world, he was invited to speak in Alexandria at the library, and he sent me a copy of his refusal. He told them, he didn't say go to hell, but more or less. He told them, and he told them why. He told them, if you did this, I'm not speaking at your, at your library. So this is what's happening around the world. And only, I must tell you, that only those who follow the whole story and see the consequences, many, many people were murdered based on the protocols of the elders of Zion because they are a danger to world peace, because they are a danger to the world, because they contaminate the world, because they want to take over the world, you have it. And it went from one movement to another, from one country to another, and today we are surrounded by it worldwide, and it's being published in every language and in every country, in many editions. It goes on and on, and it never stops. Thank you. We we'll have time for a Q&A, for questions. Yeah. And I'll just start my comment. I think there's two things. Um, last summer, a young woman uh, near Wesleyan College in Connecticut um, worked in a cafe, and she was shot dead in uh, by point blank range by a guy, a man, who was stalking her. And they discovered in his knapsack when he killed her that uh, he had a copy of the protocols of the Elders of Zion in his knapsack. So that was just here uh, several months ago. And I didn't mention, just to finish, I didn't mention that they found a copy of the protocols to, in the in knapsack of a suicide bomber because they, they incited suicide bombers that they have to do their thing because of the Jews and they carried with them editions of the protocols. So, so I mean, so, so it's here at a local level and just a, as a, just, I'm just making two observations. As you know, in, in the work that, that we're doing at ESA and that I'm doing, the whole question of Iran's nuclear weapons program is of great concern. And when I was in Geneva for the Durban II review, it, it, uh, I was telling you earlier, it's like a, sort of a light bulb went off in my head. And when you hear Ahmadinejad speak, uh, and you hear there was about 40 or 50 people that he traveled with to Durban II as a civil servant, and I spoke to many of them, and I just listened to them, and they believe the protocols of the others of Zion as the truth. People don't wake up in the morning to do evil things, they wake up in the morning to think that they're doing good things. At least the people around Ahmadinejad believe what they're doing is, is right. And the narrative of the protocols of the elders of Zion is so powerful. Ahmadinejad came to the United Nations as the only world leader to come to the conference, and as the only world leader to speak to Western power, but to speak to Jewish power. 
And this is resonating throughout the world. So when the Deputy Foreign Minister of South Africa, and in South Africa there aren't many Jews, and it's not an issue uh, there, Middle East and all these questions, you know, she receives a standing ovation from 18,000 people when she talks about how the Jews are controlling the United States and the global economy. And this whole issue is really beginning to gain traction. And it's, it's in terms of the study of anti-Semitism, I think we're so far behind that we're just beginning to, to realize the significance of it. So given you're dealing with this for, for, for years, what is your advice to people doing research on that? And contemporary anti-Semitism to scholars concerned about this issue? What, how do you see the, the future of Israel, the demonization of Israel is really beginning to take hold? And it's gaining traction. What, what is your perspective? What ought to be done, if, if anything, that could be done? Well, I wish I could advise, I wish I had good advice what to do, then I would maybe be Prime Minister of Israel. <laughs> anyway, uh, for the last 20 years, I concentrate on the protocols of the Elder Society. Why? Because I think this is the quintessence of everything, not only anti-Semitism, but all, all kinds of things that are happening in the world around the Jews, but not only around the Jews. You see, the protocols, are, they have a scapegoat. They have a ready scapegoat. And so leaders can blame the Jews for anything that's happening in their country so that they won't have, they, they won't be blamed <coughs> themselves. The first thing that I would advise is, and that is why I retired from the court before my retirement age and wrote this book. It took me six years of research to write this book. Because, first of all, I wanted to get the facts out. You know, I said to somebody yesterday, I was a judge for 31 years, and people think that the role of judges, of course, is about the law. And I said, before we get to the law, the role of judges, especially in countries like ours where we don't have juries, is first of all to find out the facts. We, this is important. Afterwards, we apply law to the facts. But first of all, you have to find the facts. Now, why I was so upset when I first learned, in the book I described my personal story with the protocols, uh, my encounters with the protocols, and why I had to write the book, but you'll have it there. But if, what was important to me was that when I started realizing the facts, a little of which I told you today, very little, I realized that nobody knows them. Whenever I speak to audiences, learned audiences, people don't know the truth about the protocols. They know that there are protocols, they know that it's a forgery, they can give you whatever they know in, in two sentences. We don't study it in school. Even people who study Jewish studies <coughs> at universities know nothing about the protocols. I mean, if you don't know the whole story, then you know nothing. So, and I, we have, we have looked away from this for 100 years. Now I say to my friends, to my Jewish friends, to my Israeli friends, I say, I mean, it's not a whole anti-Semitic world out there. There's an open-minded public out there, and they believe what they learn. And we never made the facts available to them. The, the only books that existed before mine, there existed some books, but they're all footnoted academic studies, studies, and the protocols go out to regular people who don't read footnoted academic studies. There didn't exist one book that told the story to the general readership. That is why I took six years and I said the, to write out a story. I think it's very important to get the truth out to people. So that is why I say to people, take the facts, I presented you with the facts, take it, get it out there. They're now making a feature film based on my book because it's such a dramatic story. It, this is the first thing. We have to make the facts available. We have, and secondly, we have to find ways to get it to the media, to get it to world opinion. Now, there's a big problem. Give me another minute. There's a big problem with the media. First of all, the media is biased. I, I, I can tell you, it's because I read the media and I know the truth, most of the time it's biased. But there's another thing. This story of the protocols cannot be told in sound bites. They give you three minutes, they give you five minutes, they stop you in the middle. You can't tell the truth about this story. Yes, you can tell it in a, in, a, in, a, in a sentence. You won't be believed. Unless you go in depth, like unless you read the whole thing, then you don't understand. And the media doesn't have time to tell it in depth. And the second problem with the media is, is the 
what I don't like very much, you may, you may have a different opinion, it is political correctness. Today, in order to, to be politically correct, if I go and I don't do it now, if I go on the media and I will say the protocols are false, Somebody, they have to put somebody else on the other side and will say, no, it's all true. I mean, political correctness, you have to hear both sides, you have to have equal time, and, uh, and this is what happens. So you have to find other ways to get to public opinion, where one of the, one of the ways, one of my lectures is, combating, one of the headings of my lectures that I gave to lawyers is, combating libels, is the court a proper forum? And I say we have to learn from the Nazis. I mean, we have, this week all can learn from them. They have a whole theory of how courts are a proper, proper forum to get their message across to the public. And we didn't use courts. We didn't, we don't use, we have, you know, when trials took place in the 30s, there were no proper laws. They had to find all kinds of ways in different jurisdictions to find a proper law to conduct a trial. Today, there is no such problem. <coughs> Today, the Covenant and the Conventions of the United Nations, the Convention Against All Forms of Racial Discrimination, or Religious Freedom, uh, United Political Freedom, today, and with covenants and conventions that were ratified by every country in the world, with a reservation by the United States because of the First Amendment, but that's a different story. And every country that ratified these covenants and the conventions had to enact laws in their own municipal law a court to, to, to adhere to these, to these. And in all these documents of the United Nations, there's a criminal offense of incitement against a minority, against a group, because of their religion, their ethnic origin, and so on and so forth. According to these documents, the, the spreading the protocols is a crime. You can, and, the, and it's a libel. So today, unlike in the 30s, where they had to break their heads how to go to court, today you can take them to court around the world and open the court to prove your case. But we don't do that. We always are on the defensive, you know? If there is a, if there is a Durban, we defend. If there is Mr. Goldstone, we defend, and so on and so forth. I think we should be more proactive to get the truth, the true facts, not just uh, uh, ideas, but true facts, to get <coughs> to the public at large. The public is completely ignorant of the subject. Thank you. I am sure that you are very knowledgeable about this uh, subject and uh, the facts, and I'm sure Would that you what speak we louder, heard. Please? Would you speak louder? Yes, uh, I said that uh, I'm sure that uh, you didn't uh, provide us with all the facts that you gathered in your research uh, of all those years. But uh, I think if to follow uh, what uh, Charles asked, if we really can think of a way. Please raise your voice again. If we, if we really can think of a way to uh, try to address that issue of uh, the success of those protocols, uh, one also needs to maybe analyze how come they are so successful. Uh, you don't see uh, that level of success, in a way, uh, when um, people are uh, directing their hates against gypsies, or Armenians, or any other group that you can think of, uh, with the assumption that those groups have the power, have the ambition to control the whole world. However, it was very well uh, established uh, in humanity that the Jews are on it. So I really wonder what is so special with the Jewish story here? which is different from all other minority groups. And, and the, the second part, which will be very, very short, what do you think is going to be the future of the protocols? Well, to answer your first question, it needs a seminar. <laughs> why, they, why they do it to the Jews and they don't do it to others? There's a very long Jews are separate from others because there is a very long history of libeling Jews. For close to 2,000 years, we were called Christ killers. You know, so it was all, it, it all had to do with religion. 
and I'm, I'm not going into that. And then, at the beginning of the 19th century, it became more and more political because Jews were successful minorities. They were, the gypsies were not so successful. Jews were successful minorities. They had to live by their wits. And so they, you know, I'll tell you a little story. I once appeared in Germany to promote my book in Germany. It was a big success in Germany. It was the Spiegel about the rights, they published excerpts and so on and so forth. So there was an open lecture for open to the public and I was there. So I immediately saw that some Nazis came in because you saw their body language. They sat in the first row. They were very polite, but they were waiting their time. So after I finished my lecture, one of them stood up and says, okay, you say that Jews dom don't dominate the world. How do you explain that there are so many Jews in the White House, so many Jews in Hollywood, so many Jews that get Nobel, Prize, um, uh, Nobel Prizes, and he gave a few, a few other examples. And it really got my back up, you know, because I hear this accusation all the time. So, you know, I decided to give it back to him. So I said, you know why? Because we are better. So everybody stood up. Well, how come we're better? I said, I'll tell you what. We always had to be better in order to survive. So our mothers invested in education. If you had invested in, in education, what you invest in hatred, you would also get the Nobel Prizes that we do. I mean, that was, that was like that, you know? Because, well, you know, there's a lot of studies about the situation of Jews in the world, of Jewish minorities. We are, we are separate from others, and that is why Jews survived. I don't know how, how we survived all these years, and then established a state, you know, a flourishing state. I don't know, this is a matter for historians, for sociologists, not for me to say. But we, we, we have a special fate. And why do they blame the Jews? One, because they always blamed the Jews. They've, we have a history of being blamed. And two, because there are, Jews are scattered, there are Jews everywhere. You always have an available scapegoat. And because Jews were doing well, it was always proof that they are on the way of dominating the world. Otherwise, you have to make a whole study. Now, you ask me about the future of the protocols. I can tell you one thing. I'm not naive. I don't think that if I publish a book, even if it sells a lot around the world, even more than now, if they make a movie, if they get out the facts, the protocols will vanish. They will not vanish. I always say that if I sit at a dinner, and somebody spills some soup on my skirt, my neighbor will always say, please get it out immediately, because if you let it stay till tomorrow, it will not come out. <laughs> the same happened with the equation Zionism Marxism. <coughs> I was in the committee in 1975. I was Israel's representative in the committee where Zionism was equated with racism, Zionism racism. It took 10 years to start doing something about it. And then it is the only resolution that was, that was abolished taken by, by the United Nations. For, but do you think it went away? In Durban, Durban 1 and Durban 2, I mean, it became a code word. It's entrenched in language already. If something stays there, I think that if you say protocols 50 years from now, it will be the protocols of the United Nations. It will not go away. But as I said, there is an open-minded public out there, and we have to reach the open-minded public and tell them the truth. We have to try. We won't get to everybody, but we have to try. Professor Steinberg. You mentioned that uh, Hitler saw the uh, impediments to a thousand-year riot in terms of uh, uh, the Jewish conspiracy. To what extent is the Islamic incursion into Europe now, the Muslimization of Europe, and bringing of Sharia into the United States and Minnesota and other areas, to what extent do the Muslims see the Jews as an impediment to the arrival of the Mahdi? Of their I movement? think these are two separate subjects. I don't know. I'm not an expert on the matter. There is there is Islamization, and you know, Herb, uh, Bernard Lewis says that Europe will be will be Islamic in 30 years. But I don't think this has to do with the protocols. The pro the protocols are being used by the whole Muslim world as, um, as an explanation of what's happening in the Middle East. This is it. So that is why it is on television every day. I mean, if you are, you know, if you are interested in a subject, you see it everywhere. 
There is not a day that I don't find something, some mention of the protocol somewhere. It's on television, it's in the mosques, it's in the newspapers, it's, it's everywhere. And it has to do with the conflict of the, of the Middle East. And the problem with the Middle East, I'm not going to speak about the Goldstone thing, but I'll tell you one thing. What happens, it, it, they succeeded in turning this conflict, which if you will, it's a territorial conflict, it's a religious conflict, it's an ethnic conflict, whatever you like. It's not a human rights conflict. But they, they turned it into a human rights issue. They turned the whole thing into a... Why? Because human rights have become the most important issue after the Second World War. And it goes well with all the NGO, human rights NGOs in the world. And the protocols, I mean, the fact that there is a small group there who wants to take over all the Muslim countries, and from there they'll go on to the rest of the world. And if you say it, you know, Goebbels said, the bigger the lie, the bigger the, its success. So if you say it enough times, you know, people begin, people see us as a threat. I mean, how can they think that we are a threat to world peace? How can they think? And I didn't mention one other thing which is important. You mentioned Ahmadinejad. Ahmadinejad uses the protocols in a big way. They publish the protocols and they distribute them to all the Iranian embassies in the world. They distribute the protocols. Now, I asked myself many times, why does he deny the Holocaust? He's not blamed for the Holocaust. Apart from the fact that he says that the Palestinians are blamed for the Holocaust, but apart from that, why is it so important to say that there, of course, say that the Holocaust was a European thing, the Palestinians don't have to pay for it. Okay, that's one argument. But why say that there was no Holocaust? Why is it so important? I'll tell you my personal conclusion. I don't know if it's true. I think that in order to make people believe that we are going to dominate the world, that we are dominating the world, actually, they have to rob us of our status as victims. Because if we were victims, if they killed six million Jews, if they exterminated and murdered six million Jews, where were the dominators of the world? I mean, they have to take away from us this status of victims in order to make us a threat to the world. So this goes together. And Ahmadinejad is the best example of the denying of the Holocaust and spreading the protocols of the elders of Zion and saying that we are the threat. Um, I noticed that you were careful to describe the protocols as a weapon of the anti-Semites, but that you didn't go so far as to use it as a causal explanation of anti-Semitism, at least in the contemporary Middle East. Now, my question is this. I'm reading a book right now by Andrew Boston on the legacy of Islamic anti-Semitism, and he suggests that a lot of historians of uh, who comment on Muslim anti-Semitism tend to overstate the extent to which it's a European import and the extent to which it's a continuation of European uh, anti-Semitism on Muslim ground and that he, he thinks it's more important to call attention to the indigenous Muslim roots of anti-Semitism. And the myth he's concerned about is that Jews were treated well under Islam and that Islam as a religion doesn't have anti-Semitism in its core documents and that he, um, you know, so that what, in terms of the relative weighting of these things, I wondered if you had any, had any thoughts or anything. Um, I, I tend to agree with the writer, although I didn't read that book, about we exaggerate saying that there was no anti-Semitism, that all anti-Semitism in the Muslim countries was important to Europe. I tend to agree. But at the same time, I am very firm in my belief that the protocols are a separate issue. They are not just an item under the umbrella of anti-Semitism. They are a separate issue. And this tool, this issue, was imported from Europe. It did not exist in Arabic countries before the Second World War. But there were good ties, as you know, between Muslim leaders, between Arabic leaders, and between the Nazis. And this is the legacy that they took over. So the protocols did not exist in Arabic countries until they adopted it from the Nazis. I have one comment and one question. 
You must raise your voice. Uh, one comment and one question. You just um, talked about the relationship between the idea of Jewish power in the protocols and the Holocaust denial. Um, it also seems that if uh, the Jews could actually pull off this great lie about the Holocaust, that would be really significant evidence for the thesis of Jewish power in, in the protocols. So I think there's another relationship between the two, it's an idea. The two ideas. It's an idea. <laughs> but my question is, and you seem reluctant to talk about the Goldstone Report, but do you see any relationship between the ideas of Jewish power and the interpretations of facts and laws in reports such as the Goldstone Report? No. That's a whole new issue. I, I showed Charles here. I had a course. I know Mr. Goldstone personally very well, and because I was for many, for 16 years president of the International Association of Jewish Lawyers and Jurors. Now I'm honorary president, but I conducted this association for 16 years. And I organized big international conferences in Israel and in other countries. To two of these conferences in Israel, I invited Judge Goldstone. At the time, he was still a judge. We had public trials, moot trials, where judges of Supreme Court set in the trials from different countries. And he was one of the judges whom I invited from South Africa. So he came twice, and that is how I got to know him. Uh, of course, everything is, uh, you know, is guesswork. Why he acted as he acted, and why he did as he did. But one explanation, my explanation, but it doesn't have to be the true explanation, because I'm not a psychologist, and not, I don't know, but what happened is that Judge Goldstone, uh, he did a good job with this committee that he had in South Africa. You know, he, he retired from the court to do this uh, committee that, that ended the procedure around the abolishment of apartheid. And he got a good reputation, he made a big name for himself. From then on, he began, as it were, a human rights career. He became prosecutor in the, in the court, in the, in the criminal court. And he became, he, he kind of started a career which he hopes, I think, to continue in human rights, in human, rights UN bodies. And uh, my correspondence with him, you know, I, had, I wrote to him while he was sitting in the committee. I sent him excerpts of the Hamas charter. And what I was trying to tell him is that you cannot investigate a certain event which he was asked to investigate, the war in, in Gaza. They were, they were, he was asked to investigate the crimes, the war crimes of Israel. That was in his terms of reference. Okay. But what I was trying to tell him, that you cannot investigate something like that while ignoring the general context. And I wrote examples, I sent him examples of the, of the Hamas charter, and I spoke of the context. But I think that he became so entrenched in the human rights agenda in the world, of which I, which I mentioned before, that he ignored the context. That's my explanation, because otherwise I don't have an explanation of why he did it. You know, he even, I, I, I showed you, he answered, he replied to my letter, and he said some things which I'm not going to quote. But he said one thing which really set my back up. He's, he said both sides, which means Israel and Hamas, both sides should stop demonizing each other. Here you have the whole story. I mean, I sent him excerpts from the Hamas charter that mention the protocols and say the Jews should be exterminated and terrible things about the Jews. And what do we say about them? We say they're terrorists. Not only we, Europe says they're terrorists. Everybody says they're terrorists. So how come he says that both sides should stop, you know, demonizing each other? So that's the whole story. Otherwise, you have to have a clinical psychologist, I think. <laughs> Hello. Uh, thanks for a very enlightening talk. Uh, I've got two questions. Uh, going through the protocol, uh, there are 24 protocols, I think, 18 of them. I can't understand. I can't there, there are about 24 protocols described in the book, I guess. 
Now, it seems that the insight which went into the writing those protocols is a distillation of experience of generations, not one plagiarized author. It is a very detailed, not detailed, but very insightful document. And suppose it did not exist, this protocol thing. Whatever is happening, happened in the last 100 years, and what is happening now, push towards one, uh, one uh, world government, um, controlling the resources of other countries. Do you think the protocol has to be discovered in order to achieve that one world government? If I understood well, you ask if the same purpose would have been attained without the document, right. without the protocols. No, I think the existence of the document is very important because it is proof. They are using it as proof, as I said, of, you know, if you read that, they tell you a whole story, how a lover of somebody, you know, got this document and it purports to be something that the Jews speak, the Jews say it about themselves. Otherwise, it will be just another libel, which can be refuted. So I think that um, the protocols were, were major in, in putting forward this thing about the Jewish conspiracy. There were all kinds of stories about Jews, like the blood libels, for instance, but nothing caught on. I mean, think about it. There's ample proof of the forgery. Historians, Senate of the United States, uh, courts of law, in, in, everywhere, say it's a forgery and they tell you exactly how it happened in newspapers around the world. And still, this is being published as true. Now, there were other forgeries in the world. There were the diaries of Hitler, which were forged. There, were, there was a thing also, a world germination world domination against a Japanese general, General Tanaka. There's a famous forgery. There was a famous forgery about the Jesuits, you know? Uh, I don't remember what, uh, the name. Anyway, there were famous forgeries. Now, whenever these forgeries were, the truth was revealed, they were taken off the table, they vanished. In world history, when you read books about conspiracies, you learn that the only document, which is again and again and again proved to be a forgery and still goes around the world as authentic, is the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, notwithstanding all the proof that it's a forgery. Now you tell me why. Could I have a follow-up question? Uh, what are the forces behind uh, pushing towards a one-world government going around the world? where the power will be concentrated in one body, which will control all the world. Uh, I didn't understand the question. What's the forces behind the, the, the movement to create a one government in the world? I don't understand that. Can it's you be more, uh, can you yeah. clarify your question? Like, uh, uh, like world body unitations and things like that. Uh, uh, where you, impose your laws on other countries and um, take away their uh, sovereignty. sovereignty. So what is the question? So what's the forces behind creating one government, the strong United Nations that interfere with the sovereignty of other nations or oppose their will on other nations? I don't know how this is. I'm not sure, okay. I, I, I'm not sure how it's connected to our subject. I really don't understand. Okay. Uh, 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 Professor Katz, uh, and then I'll oh, I'm sorry. <clears throat> I received the very